you completed or were asked to, to go on Desert Island Disc last year. Yes. You're also a household name because you have uh, judged all nine seasons of the Great British Sewing Bee. In terms of Britishness, I feel like the next logical step would be a knighthood. Yeah, I don't know. I think you. you I think. I think. Uh, well, I mean, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't turn one down, Joe. Um, but uh, I haven't even had a CB or MB or any of that stuff yet. So uh, I'm a long. I'm a long way from that. I think. But uh, you know. Um, yeah. Thanks. Although, I'll, I'll take that. You can. You can give me one. I appreciate that. Although I feel as though you could just jump straight to the House of Lords, because well, I mean. I'm not sure the House of Lords is long for this world. If, if you know, I think I think the Labour Party are being very quiet about the House of Lords. I mean, I think the ruckus that has gone on in the last couple of years and the absolute, you know, nailed on cronyism. I just think it's it it certainly needs reform if it doesn't need scrapping and changing for something a bit more a bit more a bit more modern. <laughs> okay, so. You don't feel like you're ready enough for a knighthood. You've turned down my offer of being a House of Lord. Let's say then the government create a department for sartorial affairs and appoint you minister. Right. What would be the first thing that you would do as the minister for sartorial affairs? I think I'd get rid of skinny jeans. <laughs> that's going in. That's going straight. That's going straight to jail. That one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. It's a bit like Room 101, this. Uh, somebody asked me about Crocs the other day, which I had a sort of similar reaction to. Um, Crocs and a suit was the question. I think it was the Sunday Times style. But, uh, yeah, that's a no as well. But um, I don't know. I think that the thing is, the, the older I get, the more, the more kind of, the more I'm just like, yeah, whatever. Do whatever, wear whatever, whatever makes you feel happy. I think, you know, life is so difficult. And clothes, wearing clothes, is is something that for lots of us makes us feel better and allows us to express something about who we are and you know when i was younger i was a right snobby little sod but um I, you know now now I, now I'm, i feel like i'm you know i feel like i've mellowed a bit i mean i i, I don't I, I mean i look at i look at ta tailored clothes people get really badly wrong and i look at a lot of tailored clothes and think oh my goodness what on earth are you thinking I remember who we were looking at the other day. I don't want to name names because it just feels mean. But there was a very high pro. Actually, it was a, it was a rugby player, a very high profile rugby player, and it was his wedding suit. And like the button, the button that was done up, like the the top button on a two button suit was somewhere up near his sternum, and then like there was this big splaying gap below it, and like it was all pulled, like you know, pulled and folded because it was far too tight, and then. It was this big sort of wedge of white, and then you could see a belt on the bottom of his tie, and, and there was it was just, and the trousers were too tight in his ass, and it was like somebody's bad, and somebody's tucked you right up here. Um, Mr. I, read, I, I was unable to attend a recent wedding, but I was part of the, I was invited to be a groomsman, so I was unable to attend, but I was in the groomsman group chat, and on the morning of the wedding, I sent a message out. I said, "Chaps, you need to be looking your best, so don't do the bottom button up of your suit." Make sure that your pocket's square, the, you can't see the edges. Make sure your tie's all the way done up. And I listed all of these things, and I just got no response from anyone. It was just, I think it's <laughs> not death is. Don't, oh, I think what else is going in the bin. Oh, yeah. Those, those, those sort of pointy polyurethane, tan-coloured, plastic-soled, like, <laughs> derbies that, you know, I was what we, I was, I drove down to South Wales uh, on Friday to pick up a fire a, 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 a mantelpiece a fire surround um from a from a vintage dealer in South Wales it's a long long way to buy a fireplace but um and we were my, my girlfriend and I were driving down the M5 and we stopped at services and obviously everyone was heading to Cheltenham and there was a group of lads and they were all there in their pastel three pieces two short trousers waistcoats all over the place but they all had those point. They're going in straight in the bin as well. Those, <laughs> those tan. And it's like the polyurethane is so bad, and they're like they sort of curl up at the front. And you know, oh god. Do you ever? If does are you ever affected at all by kilts? Because you know, with kilt jackets, how you have the argyle and the bonnie prince charlie. I saw a film yeah, yeah. last last night of this family wedding, and the. 
father was in a Bonnie Prince Charlie jacket, which he's supposed to wear with, yeah. the, with the black tie. But then he was wearing a traditional necktie with it. And then the right. son was in an Argyle jacket, which he's supposed to wear a tie with. And then yeah. he was wearing a bow tie with it. And I thought, come on, chaps. Yeah. Well, I think you're either. I mean, I think the thing is, the thing is with, with those, with the following the traditional pattern, you know, Prince Charlie with a waistcoat or Braemar with a belt, like the front of the jacket is cut in a way and the front of the waistcoat is cut in a way that presents the other bits that you wear with them in, the, in what, what is an idealized way. So, you know, if you're wearing a Prince Charlie and you've got the waistcoat on, the bow tie sits in the right size of white triangle and it all looks it looks perfect like the proportions of it all are specifically designed to look right and if you start trying to i don't mind people subverting black tie these days because everybody's doing their own thing a little bit but make it look good that's the thing <laughs> because those things are those things have been designed very specifically to go with one another and when you start changing it up, what you're doing is you you just throw in all the proportions out. And, you know, our eyes, whether we whether we, you know, whether we do it consciously or not, you know, classical proportion, you know, Grecian, Roman, classical proportion, you know, all of that Fibonacci triangle, all that stuff. That's all real. That's not like we haven't invented this stuff. And so there are things that look good to the eye and things that don't. And. And I think it's OK that people, you know, want to want to, you know, want to deformalize certain bits of clothing because, you know, we are, you know, we there is the, there is a there is an unceasing move towards informality in in men's clothes. And it may reverse, but I mean, it's been the set. It's been, you know, it's been a sort of 300 year move towards informality you know we lost the top hat we lost the morning coat we lost the frock coat we lost the bowler you know we lost the t we've lost the tie really i mean i i mean i'm glad to see you wearing one because i think the shirts that we all wear are specifically designed that little v at the top where the collar meets that is designed to have a tie sitting in it and if it doesn't have one sitting in it it sort of doesn't look right. And actually, you know, we, we do some shirts that have got, um, you know, band collars. We did them at Torts. We did them in all sorts of places. You know, because, because that sort of emptiness there, it just looks a bit sad. And it was funny. I was, at, I was at Annabelle's not that long ago. Was it Annabelle's? And it was me and one, one other guy. And I reckon he was probably in his early 20s. And he was quite a cool looking guy. We were the only two people wearing ties there. And every other man was wearing a navy blazer with a white shirt with two or three buttons undone. And I'm like, lads, you all look exactly the same. And none of you look that great. So, you know, I think it's a funny one because now a sort of tie and a suit, like the suit's gone through this amazing transformation in the last four or five years. You know, I think COVID sort of killed the idea of the suit as being a piece of office wear. And tailored clothes have just got more interesting recently. You know, the the colours, the patterns, the way people wear them. And, you know, you have to thank a little bit. You have to thank people like Harry Styles and others who, who've just, you know, blown it all out of the water. You know, brown has come back. People are wearing brown suits. People are wearing pattern suits. All this fun stuff, you know, kind of dusty pinks and all sorts of interesting colours have become quite normal. And a grey or a blue suit, Feels like something that's that's just not really, you know, not really with it anymore. I would like to say that I'm wearing a dusty pink suit because, although the weather might outside might not look like it, the calendar does indicate that it is spring, and I, yeah. I wanted to, I wanted a bit of je ne sais quoi when yeah. interviewed. So you you say you've relaxed somewhat in your perception of what other people wear. Does that mean that we, you could use your manifesto pledge? when you're now your minister for Sartor Affairs. Yeah. You could use Coco Chanel's line of fashion is anything, <clears throat> excuse me, fashion is anything you can get away with. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I look, I, um, I'm a great lover of clothes. And I, I, funnily enough, I've just written, I've just written a book that's all, and, and in this book, I'm talking about this kind of arc that we've been through. There's various arcs we've been through. We've been through an arc of consumption. Well, it's not an arc of consumption. It's an on, it's, it's an ever upward line. But we've been through an arc, been through an arc of quality, and um, uh, and and we've been through this 
you know, we've been through this huge sort of transformation of, 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 of the way we all work and, and, and all the rest of it. But one of the things in the book um, is a sort of is my sort of arc of like really loving fashion and now, frankly, hating it, because most of what, what most of what is called fashion now is frankly just a load of absolute garbage that's just being pumped out, literally being pumped out by AI, by, you know, these giant like ultra fast fashion companies. Fashion is just like, also, how can you have fashion if you're releasing 4,000 new things every day? You know, you've got like, you've got brands that are releasing hundreds, if not thousands of new products a week. Sort of the idea of fashion, almost like it's, it's eaten itself. And now the only thing that counts is, is style. And style, of course, is entirely personal. And when I, you know, different people arrive at their own style in, at different moments in their life. I, you know, some people, and I suspect you are one of these people, have always been really interested in their clothes. When I was a kid, I really gave a shit about what I was wearing. Even when I was like four years old, I was like, oh, I'm not wearing this. This is terrible. I'm having something different. I'm going to go and get my own clothes on. And, um, you know, from the age of probably 11 or 12, I was like, that's it, parents. You're not buying any more of my clothes. <laughs> um, I was very opinionated about it. And I tried lots and lots and lots of different stuff. And, you know, thankfully for me, this was before the digital camera and the <laughs> mobile phone. So all those horrendous things that I experimented with have, you know, there is very limited evidence. And what evidence there is, is, you know, in printed form in the bottom of some shoe box in the bottom of a cupboard somewhere. Um, but I got to a point in my early 20s where I sort of knew what I really liked wearing. And I knew what made me feel my best. And I was like, right, well, that's what I'm gonna. That's what I'm gonna wear from now on. And then when I started working in clothes, it was I was just expressing, th you know, expressing for the benefit of other people my, you know, my discovered rules of what looks good and what doesn't look good. And it's, you know, for me, it's mostly it's proportion, it's symmetry, it's texture, it's material. It's not a huge amount of color and print, although I've done a little bit, and I think in some cases it really works. But for me. It's a much more sort of architectural sense of clothing. You know, it's, it's having the right things, the right proportion, having harmony between the colours. Real, I'm an absolute stickler for colour. You know, when we were designing Torts collections, you know, every single pink had to be the same shade and every single, you know, if we had three browns, they had to run across all the different things. You know, it was, and, and, and texture and, and, uh, and the scale of pattern and things was always really important for us. But, um, you know, I just worked it out and then I stuck with it. And some people, some people get to that point later in life. Some people never get to it. I've got a good friend who honestly looks like he's just rolled himself in glue and jumped in a cupboard. And, you know, <laughs> that, you know whatever sticks is what he wears. And it never, God bless him, never, ever looks good. But, um, but he's happy in other ways. So that's all right. You look at, as at home in a navy crew as you do in a three-piece suit do you think that duality of being comfortable in both casual and formal has been lost and do you think it's important to try and continue that um well i think again it, i think it's just whatever works for you i mean i i actually spend much more of my life in a in a navy crew neck and a pair of you know now community clothing either uh, cameraman pants or field trousers that's like the uniform of my day-to-day -day existence and in the you know i've you know got a navy crew neck underneath here so it you know it depends on the temperature i've either got a really big thick heavy crew neck <laughs> navy jumper on the top a finer gauge one really fine one or a t-shirt and and it i mean it honestly makes life really easy but that's just what i feel comfortable in some people some people I think some people do struggle with 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 being both formal and non-formal, but I think it's very easy. You know, you just there was a there was a you know there was a there was a um, Edward VIII, uh, what's his name, David Windsor quote from 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 one of his books, and it was like it was like dress. I can't remember the bloody quote now. Sorry, um, but it was sort of always dress appropriately for the occasion was basically what it was. So if you're digging in the garden. You know, you could wear a heavy tweed suit and, you know, gardeners would have worn those in the past. But now it feels a bit anachronistic. So just sort of dress for how just for the occasion. And, we, you know, we, we always give this advice to grooms when they're getting married. You know, 
if you want to wear a pink suit to your wedding, that's fine. But if you're getting married in St. Paul's Cathedral, you're going to feel a bit of a bird. You know, <laughs> dress. You know, if if your wedding is super informal, then don't turn up in a morning suit. It's like, you know, whatever the occasion is, you want to just feel comfortable, like mentally comfortable. I mean, obviously, you want to feel physically comfortable as well, but you want to feel mentally comfortable. Also, you don't want to be super formal when everyone else in the wedding party is is relaxed. You know, just it's about just you know, clothes, clothes, clothes need to sort of reflect where we are and what we're doing. And yeah, you just want to feel, feel, feel happy in them. I mean, really more than anything, do you feel happy in the clothes you're wearing? If you do, then that's great because God knows so much else in our lives is, is kind of difficult enough without clothes becoming a chore. And that's why I think in, in some ways I really, really do wear the same stuff every day. I, you know, I think the, the 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 navy the heavy navy crew neck. I've been wearing the same heavy navy crew neck. It's got sort of suede patches on the shoulders and the elbows. It's actually up in it's up it's having a little holiday in Hoyt today. So so William Lockie who uh, who knit some of our knitwear, um, they knitted this for me about four or five years ago, and we, we want to make it for community clothing now. Uh, so it's gone on holiday to Hoyt for them because they can't remember what they made it out of. <laughs> Uh, it's quite heavy. I think it's a British. I think it's a British yarn, uh, British wool yarn. It's it's quite a kind of hard wearing. It's definitely not a. It's definitely not a soft merino, but it's like a proper bulletproof jumper. But you know, I put that on in November, and I've only taken it off three days ago because it's been absolutely you know. But it just makes like life easy. I get up in the morning. I'm like, what trousers am I wearing? Well, I'm wearing the same ones I wore yesterday until they need to go in the wash, which isn't that often. Um, so life gets very simple. I did a podcast with somebody else not that long ago. She's a designer. And uh, she asked me about packing for holiday. And I'm like, well, it's easy. I just take this little stuff. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm wearing one outfit. I've got <laughs> socks and pants. I've maybe got, you know, I've got a couple of pairs of black shorts. We do these really amazing um, plastic-free uh, plastic free sports kit now for community clothing. And the, and the black lightweight shorts are amazing they're like so that i just take those i mean I, I i remember i think it was kind of slightly jürgen teller inspired i remember see, seeing jürgen on the front row at uh at um at mark jacobs in new york 10 even 15 years ago and jürgen's there wearing running shorts and trainers sitting on the with his with his with his plums half hanging out and i'm thinking if it's good enough for jürgen it's good enough for me so that's like my holiday uniform is, you know, Etors, we did these amazing, like, loose shirts called the Lyman. And I've got loads of them in sort of olive green and, and sort of khaki colours. So I just had, and, and navy, obviously. So I have black, I have black cotton running shorts and the community clothing plastic free ones are now my go-to running shorts. So I have that and a couple of shirts and that is my holiday packing. Like, it's done. And then, of course, the stuff that I'm wearing. <laughs> um, and everything dries really quickly, so you give it a little wash and whatever. But I, you know, I can't be bothered with with packing massive suitcases full of stuff. If I've got to go somewhere, I've got to wear a jacket, fold a little jacket up, chuck that in. But you know, it makes it does make life easy. You mentioned the field trouser, and you brought them out, and I think we can confidently conclude that the wide legged trouser revolution is in part thanks to you. But tell me the background behind the field trouser because wasn't there a little conversation with Ralph Lauren as well well funny enough, there was there was uh, so Ralph Lauren really liked them a few people really liked them I mean actually originally weirdly so weirdly I was wearing one of my original pairs this morning when I came in when I came in to work but I'm now wearing a pair of cameraman I'm testing a cameraman pant in a lightweight denim so they've just come off the line this morning uh so one of the guys from the factory just brought them up for me and they're like are you expecting these i'm like okay so i'm now now wear testing them but the original ones i've got two pairs of 1950s u.s army combat fatigues and i, I wore them to death and i they were big and wide and rolled up and they were like button fly and they had all these straps and dangly bits and all sorts of stuff on them and i used to wear them all the time and it was charlie porter and Charlie Porter, who was the men's fashion editor of uh, the FT for many years and before that worked at GQ 
and he's an amazing writer and an all-round brilliant guy, one of the, the, the most incredible supporters of British fashion ever. Um, Charlie was like, oh, I love those trousers. I always, I see you in those trousers. I really love them. And I'm like, yeah, they are good, aren't they? But I, there were bits that annoyed me about them. Like they were a bit over, like there was, it, it wasn't quite like mid nineties kind of boy band style, but there was like too much stuff. There were little tabs and things and the, and the button fly was slightly annoying. So we redid them for torts and they just went an absolute bomb. And these field trousers became kind of iconic in Japan. People in like, all over Japan, like loads of stores. I think we had a, almost 60 stockists in Japan and they all carried the field trousers. We sold loads and loads and loads of them. Ralphie saw them. I went, a friend of mine who has the most amazing vintage store in, uh, in Brooklyn, um, he we used to be the tie designer at Ralph Lauren and um, uh, called Crowley Vintage, by the way, if anyone wants it. It's, it's absolutely extraordinary, although it is quite expensive. Uh, come on, Sean, get your prices down. But, um, <laughs> um, it's, um, I was in the office. I went to meet him for lunch and uh, little Ralph pops out of his office and he's like, oh, those trousers are great. And uh, so they've got the Ralph, uh, that, that weighs in his real voice. But um, <laughs> the trousers have had the Ralph Lauren seal of approval. Um, what's his name? Uh, Mickey Drexler, who who famously was the like the, the, the head honcho at Gap and started Club Monaco and has done all sorts of other stuff. Mickey Drexler loved them. He put them in. They sold them. They sold them at Club Monaco, I think, for a spell. But um, there was another American, Todd, Todd Snyder. He loved them. He loved them so much. He actually put them in his own show once um, and then bought them and slightly sneakily and then bought them and put them in his store. Um, yeah, they were. And, and I think American GQ did an article about how we had, you know, we had brought back the wide leg trouser. Um, so, so that was kind of cool. Because you're on the forefront of fashion in every sense from bespoke to ready to wear. I was disappointed that community clothing don't have a suit of their own. Is that because you have sartorial interest elsewhere? Because I just thought a nice little cotton single breasted or a corduroy would fit quite nicely. The problem we've got, so community clothing's idea, plain and simple. Actually, funny enough, we, 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 we very much say that we're not fashion. I mean, we're called community clothing. You know, clothing, clothing is something that I think has enduring value. Clothing is slow. Clothing is about quality. And I think increasingly fashion is about all the things that are kind of wrong with, with, with what the clothing industry. So we, we really, you know, we, we very specifically are called clothing because we make stuff that we think people are going to want. We want to do stuff that people want to wear for 50 years. And in 50 years time, somebody is going to want to buy it second hand. That's like our benchmark is, you know, will this jumper, will somebody want to pick this jumper up in, in 30 years time and go, oh, my God, it's a bargain. Like, look, feel the quality of that. I'm going to have that. Um, so, but, the, but fundamentally, we make stuff in British factories. Everything is made in British factories. And most of our textiles are made in British factories as well. And most of our yard tailoring factory in Britain. That's the truth. And it's absolute, it's mad, it's mad to me that we were and we have been the home of tailoring for 700 years. And tailoring used to employ so many people in this country. Um, I've just done a book about tailoring. I've just done a book called The Savile Row Suit, which is out actually in, in, in a couple of weeks time. But it's out in a, properly out in a month. But you can pre-order it in a couple of weeks time with Gestalton, the, the art book publishers. And it's a lovely book. But it's, um, um, you know, we, we've got this extraordinary heritage of making tailored clothes. And yet there is, there is one tiny little factory in, in Osset near Wakefield. And the quality is fine, but it's not my, it's, you know, I'm used to tailoring at a different level. There used to be the Chester Barry factory in Crewe, but that changed hands. And then the guy that bought it, sadly, you know, didn't manage to keep it going. But, you know, with the, you know, the Burton's factory in Leeds used to employ 10,000 people in one single factory. You know, there used to be, I think, 32 suit factories in Leeds or something like that. You know, 
we were we were the bedrock. I mean, it was the bedrock of our sort of industrial heritage. Was 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 textiles and clothing making and tailoring was a really big part of that. I mean, at one point in time, tailoring employed more people in London than any other profession. Wow! Only a hundred or so years ago, the second most numerous profession was boot making, and there were twice as many tailors as there were boot makers. There was something like 100,000 tailors living in London, working in London, about 50,000 bootmakers. Now, there are, there are fewer than 1,000. You know, wow. it's, it's extraordinary. So the reason we don't do tailoring is because we don't have a tailoring factory that we can work with. We do do cotton. We, we did a cotton blazer. We do a cotton chore jacket and a cotton blazer. The cotton blazer, we've re... There were a few bits about it that uh, that weren't quite right. So actually, we've redone it and it will be coming out again soon. So you will be able to buy a heavyweight cotton drill suit because we're doing the same fabrics in the trousers and the jackets. So the jackets are sold separately, but you'll be able to get about three different types of trouser to go with your jacket if you want it. So you will be able to get a kind of a, a sort of Monty Donish sort of suit uh, from us that will, you know, hopefully it'll do the job. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the chore jacket. My first interaction uh, with community clothing, my friend Ollie was wearing this lovely olive green chore jacket. And I said, oh, I really like your jacket. He says, oh, it's from this brand called Community Clothing. I think you'll really like them. So then I went on and I'm like, oh, nice. And then that that's really started my relationship with community clothing. So, that, so it's always nice what? to have a bit of And I think that's when marketing works like that. I think that's just lovely yeah. when cloth marketing you see it you ask you find out about yeah. it if yeah. i was to take you all the way back to your mba that uh -huh. you did at oxford your thesis was titled is burberry's formula for brand revitalization replicable replicable what aspects of burberry's turnaround did you discover and then apply in your subsequent businesses well i mean to be honest i'm not sure i applied that many of them because, you know, Burberry's case was slightly different from, from Norton and Sons and from Etors. But, um, and in fact, Burberry have gone a completely different direction now from, from, from us. So it's sort of, it's, it's, it's hard to remember what Burberry were doing uh, way back kind of 25 years ago, which seems like a long time, it's half of my lifetime ago. Um, but, um, you know, it was, to be honest, it was as much as anything, it was about the, 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 the storytelling was important, the history was important, and storytelling has always been really important in everything that I've done. And at the time, Burberry was a quality business. Um, you know, it, it, still, it still works with some very good British factories. I know that because they also make our jumpers. Uh, one of them does anyway. But, you know, it was about, it was about heritage, storytelling, and quality. Those were the things that ran through. And those have always been the things that have interested me most about clothing anyway. You know, I did an engineering degree. When I think about clothing, I think about trying to design clothes that really, really work. Like they get better with age. They really, they feel good to wear. The colors are good. The thing, you know, the fabrics look great. Everything, you know, everything is just, just right. Every little detail is thought about. Nothing is just, oh, well, we'll just use this or we'll just use that. So that, that is the thread that's run through. And it's the same. It's the same at Norton's. So when I started at Norton's, it was all about celebrating, partly celebrating the smallness of it, celebrating the provenance, celebrating the craftsmanship and and telling the stories, not only of our own teams. You know, you go into Norton's, the team are at the back. You know, you can you can meet them if you want to. Um, but celebrating the stories of those people that made the cloth for us. And I went I, I went back to only using British cloth for our woolens. You know, there were a few uh, Italian cloths in things like cottons and corduroy, speciality of the British mills. But where the British mills had cloths, so all of our worsteds and our tweeds and our coatings and all the rest of it. Um, I was like, well, we're going to use British stuff because it's better. It, you know, firstly, it's better. And secondly, we love the, the, the association with a history that goes back, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. And, and some of the mills we work with themselves are 250 years old and that's you know before we get into the lineage that brought them to that point and just the little stories you know there are i i also started working with a number of smaller independent weavers and bringing their cloths into norton so you could come into norton's and you know we could there were certain cloths 
I'd, I'd, I'd literally met the sheep. You know, I'd fed, I'd fed you know, the Ardalanish mill on the Isle of Mull that does these beautiful, natural, undyed tweeds long before Laura Piana or anybody else cottoned on to the idea. Those guys, like I've been to the farm and, you know, I've, I remember them making me a cup of tea with some milk from the farm. And it was so creamy that there were like puddles of puddles of fat on the top of the tea. I'm like, this is a novel experience. But, you know, the sheep were all wandering around the hillside. So, you know, I went out and fed one, a you know, fed them a couple of turnips. It's like that connection. Also, the mill at Ardalanish is on the south side of the southwest corner of the Isle of Mull. And the view across to the kind of Paps of Dura and like the landscape, the people. I mean, the, I mean, it's just the most incredible stuff. And that that has carried all the way through to community clothing. So it ran through Norton's. It ran through eTorts. It taught, so I started to build this network of manufacturers for eTorts because Norton's made all its own clothes. You know, we, we only made, you know, we made all our own stuff in our own workshop. Obviously, we bought the fabrics in. So I built relationships with the cloth houses, but not really directly with the big mills. But I built this association with the smaller mills. But then when I started talks, it was like knitwear manufacturers, jacket manufacturers, trouser manufacturers raincoat manufacturers and i got you know i did i did this little film with um guy buddy and denya we did it for american esquire and we like poodle drowned britain in a car jaguar lent us a car we drove around britain and visited all these amazing factories we only i think we we spent two weeks on the road and i think we covered about three and a half thousand miles okay. sadly at least one of the factories is no longer there. So um, Reed and Taylor's, and uh, I think mostly. Oh, and the Cumbernauld, the the the, the Cumbernauld uh, original Macintosh factory is gone as well. But it was fab, and and then you know, so when I started community clothing, it was all about you know just like how can we work with all of these people and give them a chance to grow and and thrive and all the rest of it. And and since then, I've added loads and loads of factories that I you know never that never knew existed. It's amazing. I've, you know, worked in this industry for almost 20 years and I'm still finding little manufacturers that I've never, never heard of. And I've just been, I've been uh, in the, in the book that I've, uh, the, one of the two books I've written, which is the one that's about, it, it's called Less. And it's about, it's about, basically it's about buying less stuff, but buying better stuff and stopping buying like this amazing quantity of rubbish that we all buy. But in the back of the book, I'm doing, um, I'm trying to do a, well, I am doing um, a, a sort of directory, really simple directory of what I'm calling artisan makers in the, in the sort of traditional sense. You know, when, when in, in 500 years ago, we bought everything directly from the people that made it. And because of that, there was a relationship that 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 required quality in in everything that they did because if you sold something to me and it was a load of garbage i'm straight back at you saying look you can have this back mate because you know i want something that works that does the job properly and you know over time and also the great thing about that relationship and that form of commerce was all the money i spent goes to you you made this thing and all the money that i'm paying for it is going to you for making it and for the materials that have gone into it. And that was really good because at that point we're valuing the materials and the skill of the craftsmanship and nothing else. And then over time, that relationship has got further and further distant and the relationship and the, 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 the money that we spend now, most of the money that we spend now goes on marketing and garbage and bullshit and all this fluff and, you know, flying people to the desert in Arizona to sit for eight minutes to watch some models walking around and then flying them back across the world. And all this absolute nonsense that goes on in the name of fashion and the amount of money that goes, you know, in designer fashion, only about 10% of what you pay goes to the people that have made it and the people that make, you know, that have grown the materials. And in kind of normal high street fashion and fast fashion, it's more like 20, 25%, but it's not a lot. And at community clothing, we're like, screw that. We want to go back to, you know, valuing the product. And that's why, that's why our product is so good. Because when you spend, you know, if you spend 100 quid with us, 65 quid of it is going on the make. You know, it's going to the makers and the people that have grown the fabric rather than 20 quid or 10 quid if you're buying designer clothes. And 
And that's why in terms of marketing, we don't have to do very much because the clothes are actually really good. And, <laughs> you know, you put our socks on and you're like, wow, these feel good. I'm going to have more of these. And then I'm going to tell my mate that these are the best socks I've ever worn because that is much more valuable in terms of marketing than, than, than anything else. And it's about, yeah, it's about sort of honesty and integrity. And I, I feel like I've come a long way from your original question, but it's, um, but yeah, it's that, it's that connection to the people that make that is the most important thing mm. and telling that story in a truthful and straightforward way. You know, we try to avoid fluffy language and blah, 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 and all that kind of Marks and Spencer's food adverts, sort of <laughs> heavy garbage. Like it's a good pair of trousers. It's made out of this, you know, have some. There's a, there's a quote from the guy who founded Molson Brewery. Molson is this really old Canadian brewery. And John Molson has this expression that I always really, really liked. And it's the expression is an honest beer makes its own friends. And I feel <laughs> like that about good product. Like if you make a good thing, an honest thing, it will find its audience. I love the the stories behind certain aspects, especially in clothing. The the mug of which is now empty of tea to my left is from a Scottish brand called Anta, and they do um, they do pottery, but they also do rugs and throws, etc. Do and they make them themselves? Yes, and oh, so I need they have to put them on my list. <laughs> I don't think I have them. A N T A, and they're ceramics, are they? They're, they're ceramics, but, but a lot of other things, um, such as rugs and throws. And the founder says that the so they're, they're right beside the farm, and then the factory is beside the farm. And the founder says that the first time that um, their wool crosses the border from Scotland to England is when they go for a trade show, because right. it's all in the house. I just love that sort of stuff. Patrick is furiously typing at the keyboard. I am. I'm, 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 I'm Googling them now. A-N-T-A. There you go. A-N-T-A. Anta, stoneware. Yeah. And where do they, where do they make them? Uh, they are north of Inverness. Or, wow. Okay. Yeah. So north. Cover. Yeah. Right. Okay. I'm going to look into them. Fine. Yeah. I mean, Elgin. I've got, there you go. Um, yeah. It's the same with everything. Like, this is the stuff again. This is what this the 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 the, the book is about. Um, it's like when you have a connection to something, it makes you feel much happier about that object. And every time you pick it up, you know you you feel something special. Like when you know where it's come from, and you can picture. You know, I've got there's, there's you know one of the tweed weavers we use, a guy called Donald John Mackay, like. I can picture that weaving shed. It is so, it is burnt in my memory. The view from his weaving shed across Luskintyre Beach. Like, it's like, and also him and his character and his humour and his, you know, his living room full of trinkets and the life he leads and, and his now sadly departed wife and their dog and all of this amazing stuff. Like, that's what makes every object special to us, whether it's our clothing or the pottery that we use to eat from or drink from, cutlery, the, the rugs we walk on, the, foot, the chairs we sit on, everything we have should have, we should feel connected to it. You know, the, the, the idea that stuff is just made somewhere, thousands of miles away, we don't know how it's made or what it's made from or who's made it, it's just stuff. It comes in, it breaks, it goes in the bin, we get some more stuff. That's a miserable way to live. Like the way, you know, the way to be happy about yourself is to have few things that you feel really, really connected to. And I don't mind that I wear the same clothes every day because I love the clothes I'm wearing and I know where they've come from. You know, I can tell you where absolutely every single thing that I'm wearing comes from. And it's like that's that's a real pleasure. And 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 it brings me happiness in a way that consuming lots of stuff, they tell us that's going to make us happy. But it doesn't. It feels empty and hollow. And, you know, it's um, and so I think this this return to a value of craftsmanship and artisan makers. And that's why I've got this directory of artisan makers, because I want to support these people. There are quite a lot of them, actually. You know, when we when we when you start looking, I was like, oh, my God, I've forgotten thousands of people on this. I mean, I was frantically emailing friends going, can you remember, like who's what's the name of that person that does that thing up in that place? And they're like, oh, yeah, so and so um so yeah it's um 
It is a way to live. I mean, also, it will cost you more money. You know, if you buy that mug that you've got from Anta, will have cost you more. I'm just looking now. There's one with a little, there's a beaker. There's a mug. 32 quid for a mug. It's got a tartan pattern on, so it's quite a complicated glaze. There's a thistle one there. But there we go. Hey, it will be it will be better. Oh, you've got all the same. It will be it will be much better made than a mass produced mug. So if you drop it, there's more likelihood that it'll bounce. Um, and if you drop it in the sink and it clangs off something else, it, you know, it'll probably survive. It will have more, it will have more tangible quality to it. It will have a higher tangible quality. But the intangible quality, that connection you have to where it's come from, will make you never drop it on the floor and never throw it in the sink because you're going to wash it. Like I've got a little mug that my sister bought me from a, from the tin shed gallery on the Isle of Vault, and I absolutely love it. And it's, it's, it's I think it's in the opening chapter of the book. I describe this thing, but you know, on the cover, um, on the cover, there's there's a couple of pieces. There's an old wooden uh, salt bowl. It's a wood bit of tree with a wooden spoon and uh, a teapot from a maker in Glasgow. You know, those things, they're, they're, they're sort of precious. And they are more expensive, but they will, you only need one. You know, you don't need the churn. You know, and I, I, I get into this long rant in the book about, about lots of cheap things and how they end up costing us more. Um, but, you know, it's not just that they cost us more, we just don't enjoy using them so much. And, and the enjoyment you get from one lovely object is really high, far more than you would get from 10 cheap objects. Where would you get really no pleasure at all? It's so funny, isn't it? Whenever we go on holiday, my wife always packs in the antimogs just to make sure that we have them wherever <laughs> we go. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Right, Patrick, I'm aware that you are on a deadline. You've been an absolute treat. I feel like I could talk to you for hours. You've got two new books coming out. Where yeah. can people find them and what date are they coming out? Um, well, the first book is called uh, The Savile Row Suit. And it's a little story. It's a story about it's, it's Savile Row, but behind the scenes. It's the makers. It's a celebration of the art of bespoke tailoring. So it's it's a sort of story. Well, it's a it's a it's a mix. It's a it's it's my little personal story about starting on Savile Row. It's my story. It's my it's my it's my the time that I've spent in the workshops of Savile Row and everything that goes on in those workshops. It's the it's the behind the curtain side of Savile Row. It's what do all these jobs do? Who does what? What's a trimmer? What's a trotter? What's straight? You know, who? Yeah, you know, what? What it means to be an apprentice tailor, coat maker, trouser maker, cutter, whatever. All of this stuff. So it's about the world of Savile Row that actually does the tailoring, and it's also for the first time ever a full, full set, a full documentation of the method of making jacket, trousers, waistcoat, and, and shirt. Um, so I, I, we followed um, one of our coat makers, one of our trouser makers, one of our waistcoat makers, and we went to Emma Willis and followed her shirt makers down in Gloucester. So it is the full, uh, nobody, has, nobody has documented the full process of bespoke tailoring and bespoke shirt making before, to my knowledge. We couldn't find a book that had it. And, Probably because it's an unbelievable pain in the ass to do it properly. Because every little detail, I actually had a technical sewing writer who was going to help me with the book to begin with. And she started um, the process of following Chris, our trouser maker. And she's, at the end of the first day, she said, I can't do this. I cannot, I can't understand what he's doing. Like it's so. Because it's, ha it's all hand work and it's, you know, just fold this and hold that and do that. And so we ended up, I ended up getting a friend of mine called Ricky Brockman, who trained as a cutter on Savile Row. And if you're going to be a cutter on Savile Row, you have to learn to make first. You don't make to the same standard that you would, you would learn to if you're going to be a trouser maker or a coat maker or a waistcoat maker. But you learn enough so that when you start cutting patterns and fitting, you understand how it's all going together. So, you know, in order to be a cutter, you have to have an understanding of the whole process. And so he was a good, so he did understand. I actually originally asked one of my coat makers if she would do it, but she's like, absolutely no way, but you know, however. So, um, but it's, it's beautiful because it's, you know, nobody has, also I think it's important that we record the craft 
in its entirety. You know, it is a historical record of a way of making clothes that I hope will continue forever because there is no better way of doing it. But it is a it is a beautiful record. The illustrations, oh my God, I mean, it's just, God bless Matt, the illustrator, for the time he spent, like, no, no, I, just three stitches on that bit there. No, if you, just that stitch just needs to go that way and then that stitch goes that way. It was painstaking, but it was brilliant. And it's a lovely book. And it's by Gestalten, who I did my previous book, um, Original Man, with. And um, it's beautiful. It's fully illustrated. There are no photographs anywhere in the book. And um, I believe it is out. What month are we now? It's March, aren't we? Uh, it's April. I think it's something like the eight, 19th of April it's out. Um, and it'll be available in all your, your sort of usual, but you can you can pre-order it through Gestalten, I think, from the 25th or 26th of this month. It's you bespoke... follow me on social media where you can avoid knowing where to buy that book. Um, but it's a it's a beautiful thing. And it's a sort of coffee table heavy, you know, it's a lovely it's a lovely thing. And it's amazing, you know, because the Taylor and Cutter did a Savile Row tailoring book in the 20s and you know it's a three volume set but you really like the, the the trouser instructions in that book are about six pages long it's like you need to be a tailor to be able to follow them but in ours it is it is fully fully step by step and there's a nice little sort of josh sims and i did this sort of timeline of the evolution of the suit all the way up to the kind of post-covid you know, modern interpretation of sort of anything goes suit, but uh, through the kind of peacock revolution and all that sort of stuff, it was fun. So, um, so it's so that one's out uh, in in April, and then I've, uh, the second book, which is called Less, which is published by uh, William Collins, so part of Harper Collins. Um, that is a book that is all about um, why we buy so much stuff. And why the stuff we buy is so bad, you know, we, we this this it, it's basically the story of consumption, the story of quality and the story of work. You know, we used to lots and lots of us used to make things for a living and we like making things. You know, we all now for, for fun and to try and make ourselves feel better, go and make things. And that used to be lots and lots of people's jobs. In fact, 20, 25 percent of the entire population of the UK just used to make clothes and textiles for a living. Never mind all the other stuff. You know, 50 years ago, there were 8 million people making stuff for a living in this country. And now there are less than 3 million. And we like it. So why can't we do it for a living? But it's like, well, because we're used to paying so little for stuff that we have no, you know, no connection to that's made a million miles away. And this kind of consumption art, how you know, we used to be told that we didn't need very much, you know, all the kind of religious and moral leaders, you know, live simply, don't have much stuff, don't be envious, don't be greedy. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, screw that. We want you to buy loads of stuff because we'll make a bunch of money out of it. So go on, you know, be as greedy and envious as we can make you. Um, and, um, and this arc of quality where, you know, for the first sort of 30,000 years of our existence, in fact, 300,000 years of our existence, we tried our best to make everything as well as we possibly could. And, you know, science and engineering taught us how to make extraordinary things. We learned to adapt the materials that we found around us. And we made things in ways that were sort of harmonious with nature. We made products, you know, I'm sitting on a chair that's probably 70 years old. But, you know, I've got chairs in my house that are easily 300 plus years old. I eat off a table that's 330 years old. And, you know, that table will never fail. It will, you will never break that table. And, you know, the Windsor chairs and all these sort of, you know, we used to work with natural materials in a way that was time consuming and required knowledge and incredible skill. But it made products that lasted forever. And we did that with everything. And then, because we wanted to make more money, we chucked all of that in the bin. And we, and we decided just, and so this arc, you know, the price of things, you know, has gone down, down, down over time slowly. Then in the last 30, 40 years, it's just fallen off a cliff, you know, offshoring and then e car and like all the things that we do now, you know, this sort of disposable, super fast, consumptive mode, you know, the price of products has fallen, you know, and you can look at it, you can plot it on clothing. You know, I've plotted it for clothing, but it's the same for everything else. You know, um, 
you know, we can now buy we can now buy a top for less than half an hour's pay. And, you know, it's uh, even 30 years ago, it would have cost us half a day's pay. And, you know, not that long before that, it would have been a week's pay to buy a piece of clothing. And you can see this arc. But the, the, the arc of quality is the thing that really drives me nuts. Like, we know how to make good things. But actually, because we're so driven to buy more and more stuff, it has to be cheaper and cheaper. And so we make things in a way that we know is never going to last. We know that they're rubbish. We know they're going to fall apart. We don't care. Most people, consumers and manufacturers, have this sort of tacit pact that it doesn't matter if it's garbage because I'm going to buy another one in six months' time anyway. So it's that so it's that story. But it's also the story of how, you know, returning to valuing things can make us happier and also could provide lots of very meaningful jobs. You know, we're we're in a we're in a crisis of work in this country and its own offshoring has killed millions of jobs, making jobs. And making jobs, you know, the, the, the trouble with the trouble with what we've been told is the right way to kind of build our economy, this knowledge based economy. It's not everybody has the the wherewithal to to go to university and learn how to be a programmer or do whatever. You know, there are lots of people who develop at different rates, whose minds are different, who might not be academically minded, but give them a piece of wood and a chisel can do amazing things. And, you know, we've left all those people behind. You know, millions and millions of people are leaving school now with nothing to go to. AI is going to make that infinitely worse you know we we know that probably another seven to nine million jobs will disappear in the next well by by 2035 is the estimate we should be you know we really need to be taking stock because if, if we had less had better and did it all locally with highly skilled people you know we'd use at less than a tenth of the natural materials we'd have less than a tenth of the carbon footprint and all, we'd all have happier jobs and we'd all like our stuff more. And that seems to me like a pretty straightforward proposition. What a message. What a man. Patrick Grant, thank you very much. Thank you, Joe.